Let's talk about Kepler's three laws. These laws are referenced very briefly in the AP Physics 1 class, but the truth is that they have much more complex mathematical and physics principles than what's included in that curriculum. We can analyze the first law with our own solar system where planets travel in elliptical orbits with the sun being one focus within that ellipse. We can illustrate this orbit first by drawing our ellipse and then placing our first focus, F1, and then our second focus, F2. If we take the example of our own solar system, F1 represents our sun and then F2 is empty, like it usually is. And then we also have two points on the closest end to our sun and then the farthest end from our sun. The closest end to our sun is called the perihelion and then the farthest end from our sun is called the aphelion. These locations begin to come into play when you're looking at the varying velocity of a satellite as it's going around a planet or a sun, or if you're looking at the law of conservation of energy or the law of conservation of momentum during an orbit. So this diagram still has much more within it to be labeled, but first we should reference our axes. We can call this Y, and then this is X. So within our actual orbit, within the ellipse of our orbit, we have a major axis and then a minor axis. We can call this our major axis, which stretches from perihelion to aphelion. And then from the top of our ellipse to the bottom of our ellipse, we have our minor axis. We can divide the major and minor axes even further, first by drawing our central point within our ellipse, and then seeing that half of our major axis is going to be our semi-major. And we can denote this with the variable a, which means that everything on this side is also a. And then we can do the same thing for our minor axis. Top to middle is our semi-minor, and then that's denoted with b. Evidently, this means that our major axis is equal to 2a, and then our minor axis is equal to 2b. There's another variable that we can define in this drawing, which is c. And c is the distance from the center of our ellipse to one of the foci. So if we use f2 right here, then c is center to f2. There's one more property that we can define of this orbit, but first we have to draw the planet that's actually orbiting. So let's assume that we have a planet on the edge of our orbit, and it's not at the perihelion or the aphelion. In this situation, we can say that the distance from our planet to our first foci, we can define this as r1, radius 1, and then the distance from the planet to the second focus, which is r2, we can say that r1 plus r2 is actually equal to 2a, which is our major axis. The crazy thing about this property is that that relationship exists no matter where the satellite is in the orbit. If the satellite is here, the same relationship occurs here, here, here. So it really doesn't matter where on the orbit it is, R1 plus R2 is always going to be equal to the major axis. Let's interpret another continuity, but let's draw a new ellipse. So we'll have our central point, and then we'll have our first focus, and then our second focus, and then let's make sure to draw our y axis and our x axis. So in this situation where the planet is at a location where the ellipse intersects the y axis, in this situation r1 and r2 are equal and they are both equal to A, which is the semi-major axis stretching from the center to the aphelion. So because this is true, because R1 equals R2, which is equal to A, and we know that the distance as seen here from our central point to a foci, we know that's equal to C. So let's draw that right here, that's equal to C. And we also know that this is equal to B since this is our semi-minor axis.
So right now we formed a right triangle. We know that C squared, which is right here, plus B squared, right here, is equal to R2 squared. But we also know that R2 is equal to A. So we can substitute R2 for A, and we have C squared plus B squared equals A squared. This is essentially the Pythagorean theorem, but variables are rearranged because this is not A, this is not B, and then this is not C. It's C squared plus B squared equals A squared. So now is a great time to bring in something called eccentricity, which will explain why this equation is so important. So the definition of eccentricity is that it describes how circular an orbit is. If we take an example of an actual circle, the eccentricity of this would be zero, since that's basically our baseline. A circle has an eccentricity of zero. Not all planetary orbits are actually circles though, which is why eccentricity is always varying. If we take the example of our ellipse once again, so to understand this, let's go back to an elliptical orbit. Let's draw our center once more, and then let's only draw one focus, F2. So we've already defined that the distance from the center to F2 is equal to C, and then the distance from the center to the aphelion is equal to A. One equation for eccentricity that we can use is that E eccentricity is equal to the value of C over the value of A. So if we were looking back at this circular orbit where the eccentricity is equal to zero, in order for this to be the case with this equation, E would have to be equal to zero. So C would have to be equal to zero over A. So we know that the lower end of what our eccentricity can be has to be zero because the C value cannot be lower than zero. But what is the higher end? The highest that C can be is A because our focus could be at the aphelion. So C can never be greater than A. This will never happen. So if C is equal to A, and then our equation for eccentricity says that C has to be placed over A, this would be equal to one if C and A were equal. So that means the higher end of what our eccentricity can be is one. But let's say you don't have your C value. Let's say you only have A and B and your drawing of an ellipse. Let's look at some other ways and some other equations to determine the eccentricity of an orbit. So this is the perihelion and this is the aphelion. Let's draw our two foci. We can define the distance from the perihelion to the first foci as being our min, which is the minimum distance that a planet can be from the sun. And then we can call the maximum distance that a planet can be from the sun, we can call that r max. And there are equations for r min and r max, and they do include eccentricity. So if you know what your two r min and r max are, you would be able to solve for eccentricity if you also know a. So the equation for r min is a times one minus e, and the equation for r max is a times one plus e. So let's say you're working with the R max equation. You knew every variable except for E. So to solve for E, you would only have to divide R max by A and then subtract by one. We can call this our second method for finding eccentricity. For our third method, we can set C equal to A times E, which is always going to be constant with orbits. And then if you remember our B squared plus C squared equals A squared, relationship, we can substitute C for AE, so we have B squared plus AE squared is equivalent to A squared. So let's simplify this equation. We can set B squared equal to A squared minus A squared times E squared. And then that would simplify to B squared equals A squared 1 minus E squared which is where we just took a squared out. If we solve this for e, we have e equals the square root of one minus b squared over a squared. And you'll see that this equation right here is generally what people use when they're dealing with eccentricity and they're attempting to find it.
If we take a look at some example eccentricities of real planets and dwarf planets, we have Venus, which is very, very close to zero, and then Pluto, which is not as close to zero, and it's closer to 0 0.25. So we can see that Venus is very close to a circular orbit, but Pluto's looks a little bit more like this. And that was your crash course on Kepler's first law and eccentricity.